And welcome to uh, Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. So glad to have you with us tonight. And i um, glad you could take some time out of your day to join us for uh, adventures in the Word of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, just want you to know that God is good. Jesus is Lord. And uh, it's just going to get better from here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. We've been... Um, study for um past few weeks and we'll continue so for the next 27 weeks after tonight <laughs> um studying from the bible in the light of our redemption by e w Kenyon, um the basic bible course and uh again we we highly recommend you pick you get this and uh, have it in your library and uh, study this with us. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. All righty. <clears throat> we're in lesson 10. And we are discussing um, the deliverance from Egypt. Now remember, um, you know, God's made a covenant with Abraham. And after 400 years of, of captivity, God is now going to deliver Israel um, from captivity in Egypt where they had gone. Um, as guests, as um, as heroes, uh, into the land of, uh, of with seventy people, and they multiplied. There rose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and the people were um, afraid of the Jews because they were blessed and everything they did was good and everything was you know going great, and uh, and so they turned against them, made the, turned them into slaves, and. Um, <clears throat> They had been in captivity and hard bondage, and finally, um, we have we have the story of um, Moses seeing the burning bush, and um, God saying, I've, "I've I've heard the cry of my people, and I'm going to go, I'm going to deliver them." Praise God. Um, just you know, uh, Kenyon makes note here in the, the, the uh, preface of this chapter how that the historical account in the Bible. Uh, of everything that was taking place in that time is accurate with archaeological archaeological evidence, et cetera, and, and uh, non non biblical history of how the how the Egyptians lived and did things. They even, they even found um, um, I think uh, pots or whatever made out of stubble instead of straw, and so. Um, Written as a first-hand account and not as someone maybe 400 years B.C. as, as um, people try to do. You got all kinds of people who spend their life trying to discount the Bible. You know, uh, they, they, everything they can do, they, they do. And they, and they usually end up proving the Bible. And um, that's just the way it goes. Um, and so we, God sends Moses. Aaron is his helper. And... When uh, he shows up, the, um, it says, God says, let my people go so they can worship me. And um, Pharaoh says, no. And, uh, and, we, and, and um, we have the first miracle here. Um, we obviously have the Egyptians, um, magicians are not just magicians. They're, they're tapped into demonic power. And are able to uh, work certain things that are demonically inspired. You know, there are lying signs of wonders. And so don't ever think just because uh, something miraculously happens that um, it was God. There are lying signs of wonders. There is demonic manifestations. And uh, we have here uh, in the seventh chapter, um, down in verses uh, seven, chapter seven of Exodus eight through thirteen, Moses um, tells Aaron to cast his rod down; it becomes a serpent. Now the the Egyptians magicians do the same thing, throw theirs down, but the but the rod of um, the serpent that came from the rod of Moses ate theirs up, and um, that probably freaked them out a little bit. But, um, again, when you um, have false narratives 
or you believe in a narrative, no matter how much truth is shown beside it, there are people who will deny everything on the planet and still follow that narrative. And when you follow false gods, as they did here in Egypt, and you believe in these false gods, and uh, all the plagues of Egypt were against one uh, a god of Egypt, that God came and just utterly, um, and ultimately it destroyed the deity of Pharaoh. Uh, this proved the deity of Pharaoh as a god. And God took every one of their gods and put them on display as a false god. And um, so just know this, there, is, there are satanic miracles, satanic signs, uh, which doctors have used in different countries um, supernatural manifestations to keep people in check, and you know, and and, and people freak out over the, you know the power of darkness, and um, when they don't know any better, they don't know the true, the living God, um, they're they're afraid and live in captivity and bondage. And I can tell you one thing that um, differentiates <laughs> one thing, but the, a major thing. Uh, between demonic miracles and, and godly miracles is demonic miracles bring people into fear and bondage. The miracles of God bring them into faith and liberation. It sets the cap. They set the captives free. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, and so God <clears throat> comes and begins this, the, these, and listen, there's, I think 10 plagues in Egypt and um, and our lesson doesn't cover each one of them. Um, go watch the Ten Commandments if, if you want to, uh, the two-hour version of it. Well, actually, four-hour version. That's a long movie. I forgot it's a long movie. Uh, you might want to just read the Bible. <laughs> That'd be better. Be more accurate. Um, hallelujah. Now, so the plagues um, that, that smoke Israel, the Egypt's strength, its stubborn heart, um, so when he turned this, the, the rod into a snake and then the magicians copied it, um, these were just signs and quickly forgotten. I mean, uh, you know, so God had had to continue to do this and judge the gods of Egypt. And um, the plague that was sent that where he turned the um, waters of Egypt into blood. He said in Exodus 7, 15, Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning, lo, he goeth unto the water. Thou shalt stand by the river's bank to meet him. Um, God tells Pharaoh to meet him at the river. Or Moses does, as the voice of God. And we see this. The God of the Nile was um, an impersonation of Nu, in you, a chief father God of Egypt. And an object of profound veneration in this section of Egypt. God was going to assert his supremacy over this false God. And um, while he's standing at, while, while Pharaoh is standing at the waters, uh, by the waters at the very altar of his false God, the message of Jehovah was delivered. And the God, this, the, the God and his worshipers were alike to be judged. And so the Lord spake to Moses and said to Aaron, Take thy rod and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Now, one thing that happened over the years is the Egyptians had taken the male children of the Jews because they were populating like fly, uh, uh, like uh, rabbits, apparently, is what they, you know, kind of the idea or the statement. And we kill the male children and throw them in the river. The blood of God's covenant people was in the river. And remember this, when, a when Abel was slain by Cain, the blood of Abel cried out for vengeance or justice. The blood of Abel cried out for justice. And um, so this river of blood was going to tell the story of, of the deed of the Egyptians and the horror of it would rise and cling to the Egyptians. Now, the second affliction, um, 
The second plague was an affliction well known and dreaded. It was described in words, every one of which must have gone home and filled the breast of every Egyptian who heard the words of God by Aaron with loathing and dread. Behold, I'll smite thy borders with frogs. The river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into thy bedchamber, upon your bed, into the house of your servants, upon your people, and into the ovens, into the kneading troughs, and the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon thy servants. In Exodus 8, 24. Um, behind these words, the affliction, which uh, we know these animals to be in Egypt, and the plague immediately acquires a significance, which is terrible. Hallelujah. You lose sight of the insignificance of the instrument and the magnitude of the chastisement. The plague of frogs, not only a terrible chastisement of, on the people, but also another judgment upon their gods. Frogs were always a great nuisance in Egypt. And from the beginning, the driving of them away was entrusted to a goddess called Heki, H-E-K-I. So many, uh, she appears many times with the head of a frog. <clears throat> so important was the office which she had, was able to fulfill that she was supposed to be one of the supreme goddesses of all of Egypt. Because she, she was supposed to keep the frog population under control. Now, I'm not sure why they didn't like frogs, but apparently they didn't like frogs. And uh, this plague freaked them out. The covenant god of the Israelites the slave of the Egyptians again shows himself greater than the gods of the mighty Egyptians. But Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardens his heart more. And the plagues continue to come. Um, between Exodus 8, 16 and 19 and 8 and 20 and 24, uh, there's an account of the plagues of lice and then flies. Another a judgment manifest against the gods of the Egyptians. Flies were also worshipped in Egypt. I don't know why you worship, well, Beelzebub, the maggot god. All right. Um, I guess that's what it was. Also, they were, first of all, the mere sign had been given when the rod had been changed into a serpent. Then personal discomfort revealed God's power and displeasure. But now, along with the peril by the, brought by the flies, their garments, furniture, trappings were destroyed. The land was corrupt by reason of the flies. That's just nasty. Flies laying eggs on everything. Maggots coming out. I mean, just everywhere. <laughs> Y'all grossed out yet? Hallelujah. In the fifth plague, God goes further. He lays hands upon one of the most valued possessions, their cattle. Um, the matter was not to end when Pharaoh said no to God's demand or when he promised obedience and then neglected to fulfill his promise. Again, Moses was sent with the message, let my people go that they may serve me. And Pharaoh is warned, if thou refuse to let them go and will hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is laid upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, and upon the sheep. There shall be grievous moraine. Now, I don't know about you, that just don't sound good. Anytime the word grievous is entered into as a description or an adjective, it doesn't sound good. And then Exodus 9, 1 through 5, you know the separation between the Egyptian and God's Covenant people continues. Nothing was to die of the cattle of the Israelites. Now the possessions of Egypt's, Egyptians have been touched and the most part of Egypt's wealth. Now in the six plagues, their bodies are touched. They are smitten with painful and loathsome disease, which the Egyptians, their champions in this conflict, confess to be from the hand of God and at once retire from the contest. In other words, you know, they've been keeping up a little bit with, with what Moses was doing, but then they just got to the point there was they couldn't they could not keep up with the power of God. God just and God just kept up in the ante, as it were, against their gods. 
And uh, they just gave up. Uh, um, you know, they just, just gave up. Hallelujah. And then we notice the mercy of God in his dealings. His mercy sent mild chastisement at first to turn them away from disobedience, to save them from the final and awful calamity. When they didn't work, the heavier strokes came uh, in order to try to turn them away from the false gods, and they still did not. The seventh plague, a distinct advantage is made in the severity of the chastisement. There's now to be a loss of life as well as crops. Behold, tomorrow, Exodus 19, 9, 18. So ran the divine command. About this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as not been seen in Egypt since the foundation thereof until now. Remember, the hail will fall from the sky and burn as fire upon the ground. Um, chapter 10, verse 4 through 6, an eighth plague is announced. The word locust <laughs> had a terrible sound in the ear of the Egyptians. And in uh, verse 7 of Exodus 10, for the first time we hear the uh, remonstrance in court. The princes and great men who surrounded the king, who revere him as God, are driven to forget the awful distance that stands between them and the throne. They throw aside in very evident terror their habitual reverence and expostulate with the Lord of Egypt. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go that we may serve the Lord their God that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest that thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed. And um, every man was shut in. God, during those awful three days and nights, all business was suspended. Everything was laid aside. Each dwelt alone. King, counselor, nobleman, priest, merchant, art, artisan, peasant. They were isolated. Each was held in God's hand and confronted with the questions spoken uh, in the memory of one plague after another and reiterated in the consciousness of this. Canst thou dash thyself against the buckler of the Almighty? These three days of all struck isolation permit us to look into the depths, the, the infinite compassion which would have saved Egypt from the last stroke, which was to break all that stubbornness and pride. God also showed his supremacy over the sun, which again was one of the chief gods of the Egyptians. Wow. God just keeps coming and he keeps taking down one king, one God of the Egyptians after the other and one after the other and one after the other and proves himself mightier until he came to the final God in the eyes of the Egyptians. And that was Pharaoh. Remember, to the Egyptians, Pharaoh was deity. He was a God-man. And God would have his way against the last God of Egypt. We're reminded of the blood covenant and then the Passover meal here. This Passover meal was a refreshing of the covenant. And remember, uh, King talks about earlier about, about blood covenant and, and alludes to uh, the book of the Blood Covenant by H. Clay Trumbull, uh, which Kenyon wrote his mini book more as a companion to um, and, and bring out spiritual concepts from it um, instead of rewriting the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's suggested that you read that, that book, H. Clay Trumbull's, H. Clay Trumbull's um, The Blood Covenant. I do believe it's still in print. Uh, it's been in and out of print. Um, everyone should also about pick it up, begin to reprint it again. Um, very, um, I don't want to say again, a laborious, but scholastic type reading written more, more from a scholastic writer than a casual modern mini book writer. How about that? I guess that's, you know, a sermon written. This, this is, this is studied. And uh, more, almost like a doctoral dissertation um, type book. But Kenyon takes it and breaks it down in his mini book and um, read together or, or concurrently or um, consecutively will be, would be a, a tremendous help to you. Um, but one of the things that, they, that um, Stanley and Livingston encountered in their travels across Africa was 
that once they had made a covenant with a tribe, they may go a certain long period of time and then re-encounter that same tribe and they would sit down and have a renewing of the covenant meal where they once again sat down and they would renew the vow of their covenant. Was they, were, they weren't recutting it. It was a renewing of the covenant or refreshing or reminder. And Passover became that renewing of the covenant meal for the Jews. Um, and so the Lord was going to give fresh evidence of his fidelity to the covenant of his blood friendship. Of, of strong blood friendship with Abraham. Um, a new start was to be made in the history of redemption. The seed of Abraham was in Egypt and the Lord would bring them, bring thence and liberate that seed for its promised inheritance in Canaan. The Egyptians refused to let Israel go at the call of God. Now, as we study the last plague that came upon them, we see the significance of the blood covenant. In the original covenant of strong friendship between Abraham and the Lord, it was Abraham who gave his blood in token of the covenant in circumcision. Up to this time, the Israelites had nothing to do, had nothing to do. I'm sorry, I can't, let me read this right. The Israelites had to do nothing to avoid the plague. There we go. Boy, I'll tell you what, you get one word that's in the wrong place, it'll mess up the whole meaning. They had to do nothing to avoid the plague. Now, there was an act of the shedding of blood that they were escaped the 10th plague. And this is the covenant reminder. The Lord commanded the choice of a lamb, a male without blemish. The lamb was a type of Christ, so it had to be perfect. The blood of the lamb, a type of Christ's blood, was to be put on the two side posts and the lintel of every house of the descendant of Abraham. And the blood shall be for a token upon your houses where you are, saith the Lord to his people. And when you and when I see the blood, that's the token of the blood covenant with Abraham, that's added. I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Exodus twelve, seven through thirteen. See, when they put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. It was mixed with hyssop, and so, and it, so it ran. It would drip. If you were to draw a parallel and a perpendicular line connecting the blood, you created a cross. Jesus said, I am the door. you got to go through the cross, through the door, into the covenant. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. And there's, I love the typology that we, it's so simple and hidden in Scripture, and there it is right there all along, you know. You obviously, here's you got the cross. Jesus is the door. You enter in, you're covered by the blood. Hallelujah. And um, they were to eat the lamb thoroughly roasted and leave nothing. And as um, Doc Horton used to say, uh, one of our instructors, Raymond David Horton's dad, uh, but Doc, Doc Horton, old ch uh, church of God preacher, man could preach. Glory to God. But he was one of our instructors at Ramah. He said when they came out that next day, they went out with the blood over them and the lamb in them. Praise God. Amen. The blood over them and the lamb in them. Amen. We're, we're kept in our covenant relationship with God. Can you say amen? Or give me a thumbs up out there. I know you, you, I can't hear you say amen, but I can sure see your thumbs up. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. All righty. Yeah. Anyway, I look up here, I'm seeing about my, my um, what you call it, the uh, closed caption rolling across my screen, and they keep putting the lowercase God out there. He's a big God. You can lower your case if you want to, software. God's God. He's big. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Um, the flesh of the chosen lamb was to be eaten by the Israelites reverently as the indication of the inner communion with the blood friendship rite secures and in every accordance with the common custom of the primitive blood covenant rites everywhere. The last plague broke the heart of Egypt. Death, terrible, 
everywhere made an awful pause in the life of the pleasure-loving Egyptians uh, people. When anyone died in Egypt, it especially caused a great mourning. It may be imagined then what effect this last affliction had upon the entire people. The word teaches us that there was not a house in which there was not one dead. Now it's talking about Egypt. Israel was covered. Those who might have mourned with others, instead of being able to mourn with others, had to bow under their own grief. Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all of his servants and the, all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead in Exodus 12.30. But when we have noted the grief of Pharaoh and all his people because of their dead, we have not summed up all that was accomplished by this judgment. Exodus 12.12 12 reads, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. Notice this phrase. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Both the words are placed against these, both man and beast. Animals were worship in Egypt, and the Pharaoh, remember, was considered incarnate and was worshipped as a god. Now Pharaoh, who was worshipped as a deity, had been um, is smitten and chastised in his own land and in the presence of his own people. His hair had already been held with divine honors laid there in the stillness of death. It was impossible to doubt that the blow was from the hand of God's covenant, from the covenant people's God. At the same time, the firstborn of Israel were safe. Not one of the plagues had touched God's covenant people. Great fear came upon Egypt. The hand that struck might strike again. Freedom was therefore given to the oppressed Israelites. They were thrust out. Pharaoh would not even wait for the day's dawning. He called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get ye forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. Go serve the Lord Jehovah as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we will all be dead men. Like, get out of here. Get out of here. We, 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 we can't fight this. If you were with us on Sunday, um, preaching God is our help. Very present help in trouble. Um, the attack on the church that Satan has been bringing with everything he's got. I mean, we, we in this country, it's been an unleashing of absolute hatred toward the church. The spirit of Antichrist has risen up, but God is still God. And God is bigger. And God will have his way against the gods of the world who rise up against his covenant people. He will bring them down. He will judge the gods of the world. Mark my word. And he will liberate his people. He said, Pastor, I've been going through some stuff. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Praise God. I said, praise God. Hallelujah. Liberation and freedom comes in Jesus Christ. We do not need to fear. We do not need to be afraid. We're the, covenant, the blood covenant people of the covenant keeping God who forever honors his word forever. O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And I keep covenant to a, uh, a thousand generations. Hallelujah. I think they said when somebody said one time a Jewish generation was 44 years. If you kept covenant to a thousand generations, that's about 44,000 years. Um, I think the rapture is going to happen before then. Just, my guess. <laughs> if not, we got another 42,000 years of God keeping covenant. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All righty. 
Well, let's um, let's jump into our questions. Praise the Lord. King is right. It says, show how the scriptural account gives us a true picture of ancient Egyptian life. And um, the answer is from the description of Pharaoh's authority and the magicians, the Egyptian priesthood, to the archaeological uh, finds of bricks made with stubble instead of straw. The scriptural, the scriptural account of Egyptian life is accurate. The Bible describes it to a T. Okay? Um, what was the first miracle that was performed in Pharaoh's presence? Was Aaron's rod being made a serpent? And then, of course, I want to tag on the back of that and swallowing up the Egyptians' magicians' rods. Hallelujah. Now, what spiritual significance may be given to that miracle? <clears throat> As the rod of Aaron swallowed up the rod of the Egyptians, so would the religion that God was about to establish swallow up the elusive tr uh, trust by which wise men of the world sought a knowledge and a greatness that was still that still left them and their followers slaves of Satan. See, all the religions of the world and all the uh, wisdom of the world and all these things and all the liberation to live in sin and enlightenment that people have to live in sin keeps them in captivity to Satan. Only Jesus Christ, God through his covenant, first with Abraham and to his seed after him. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise are truly liberated and set free. For he whom the son has set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Praise God. <clears throat> and what way did the first plague bring down judgment upon Egyptian God? The male children of the Israelites had been thrown into the waters, and now God would bring that sin of the Egyptians to their own remembrance. The river of blood shall tell the story of their deed to the earth and heaven, and the horror of it shall rise and cling to them. They were reminded of their horrific, brutal sin of throwing babies in the river. And God brought judgment on them. Drink here, drink the blood of the, the the blood of the innocent victims of your senseless murder. In what way did the first plague bring? Uh, I'm sorry. What was the second plague and its significance? And the second plague was the frogs. Uh, it's significant because Heki H E K I was the Egyptian goddess and was supposed to protect them from the frogs. Now, that is one of the good things they have in the Ten Commandments. I believe one of the, um, um, some of the statues they have around the room are gods with frog heads on them, uh, I believe, in, in, the, in, the, in the king's you know, court area. And, um, I, and all my talking about Hollywood and inaccuracy and stuff, there were a lot of things that Cecil uh, B. DeMeyer did try to do with accuracy, historical accuracy. Um, but you just can't take it as doctrine. He, he did a lot of things that he really did to be accurate as much as he could with things. However, it's still not doctrine. We have to follow the Bible, okay? Hollywood does, still does play into it. But he, a lot of things he did was just, you know, a lot of research and a lot of work um, to, be real, to be realistic. <clears throat> um, praise the Lord. Now we're talking about the 1958 version color talkie and not the 1920-something silent movie he did of the Ten Commandments. Hallelujah. That's somebody going, huh? What, what was that? Never saw either one. Oh. What? I've got, I've got a, a person in the cheap seats going and never saw either one. Oh, Lord. Okay. God once again shows that the God of the slaves is greater than the gods of the Egyptians. Have you ever noticed now how on talk show TV, 
you know, all the view and on CNN, on MSBC, the sneer and the snarl and the uh, disdain for evangelicals, in particular white evangelicals. It's just, it's, there's a hatred. There's a hatred, absolute putrid hatred for Christians. But our God is bigger. And God will rain down judgment on the false gods of this world, of the pleasures and gods of this world, of perverse sin, perversion. God will judge it. Now, he wants to redeem people, but he will judge it. And if they'll turn, he'll liberate them. But he will judge it. And Jesus is only love. Well, I'm so dumbfounded about that statement sometimes. Love sometimes, God chastens those whom he loves. He will do everything he can to redeem people from destruction because eternity is a long time to go to hell with no way out. As Pharaoh refuses to yield, show how the afflictions become greater. First of all, God gave signs then plagues that caused personal discomfort. Now the plague of the flies that came on the land corrupted the land because of the flies. I mean, they were just, they were just under this assault of flies plaguing the land. Can you imagine the stench and the smell of the, from the filth throughout the land? How did the ninth plague reveal his mercy before the last plague came. Because for three days, everyone was shut in and had to face the question, can you dash thyself against the buckler of the Almighty? They didn't have, they didn't have reinforcements to convince them that, you know, it's right to continue to fight. They were on their own having to answer that question. In this way, in what way did God give evidence of his fidelity to the covenant? The seed of Abraham was in Egypt, and the Lord would bring thence this, that seed for its promised inheritance into Canaan. What's the effect of the tenth plague? The death of the firstborn broke the heart of, the, of Egypt, and Pharaoh hastened to let Israel leave Egypt. How was it revealed that the plagues were sent by the covenant God? Because Pharaoh's own house suffered from the plagues, including the death of his firstborn son, who had already been held with divine honors. And so here we have it. God comes in his blood covenant relationship with his people to bring deliverance from Egypt. Remember, and God remembered his uh, covenant with Abraham. And God brought deliverance. And God brought liberation. Hallelujah. And liberated the people of God based on a covenant with Abraham. That covenant was renewed at that Passover meal. And, and, and then the Passover meal becomes what we refer to as the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, Holy Eucharist, Communion. Um, as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, and you show the Lord's death till you come. So what Jesus does is they're sitting down having the covenant renewal meal, and he elevates it into the new covenant meal and reminder of a covenant with God. That is now with the fulfilled seed of Abraham. Next week, we'll talk about the covenant people of God in the wilderness. You know, um, somebody once said a number of years ago, it was, actually it was uh, one of our members' father, used to say, 
If you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. There's a lot of Christians who watch God do all kinds of stuff and then go go and then go dumb. And that's why Israel walked around for 40 years. Because they went dumb. <clears throat> anyway. And even in their stupidity, wandering in the wilderness, he was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. They basically had outdoor heat and air. At the right time. The heat in the, the desert could... Um, um, Deserts can drop as much as 60 degrees from daytime highs. So from 120 down to 60 degrees. Can you imagine being 120 in the, in the, in the middle of the day and overnight six, that's a 60 degree temperature drop. Now there's something kind of, you know, and your, re your body's regulating to that, back and forth to that. Let's just say, um, let's use this scenario. Um, it's 85 every day and 20 degrees every, and 25 degrees every night. That would mess you up, wouldn't it? <laughs> it messed me up. <coughs> and um, But God just came as the pillar of fire by day, night and a cloud by day. He kept the heat, extreme heat off and the extreme cold out. Praise the Lord. So God, the covenant-keeping God, delivers the children of Israel, Israel by judging all the gods of Egypt and bringing them out with a strong hand. Praise the Lord. Let's join us next week for the uh, church, uh, the covenant people of God in the wilderness. And then join us this coming Sunday back at our normal, uh, our currently normal time of 1.30, 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock, um, meeting and using New Life Family Church's uh, church for right now um, until we purchase our own place. And um, we'll be back on the fruit of the Spirit. I believe this week is meekness. Uh, if you were not able to be with us on Sunday, I encourage you to go back and listen to that message. Um the, uh, the preach anointing, the preaching anointing was there, and uh, I had a blast. Praise the Lord. And um, so much I didn't want to stop. I wanted to go all day, um, but it, I couldn't. Hallelujah. Anyway, um, but come out and be with us. We'd love to have you join us. I know it's an afternoon service. We will be getting back to a morning service as soon as we find a permanent location again. Um, and this next time, it's going to be our own home. We're, we're planning on having our own permanent home that belongs to us instead of re renting or leasing or borrowing, uh, having our own home and uh, moving forward from there. Uh, but until we meet again, uh, we love you. God loves you. And remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. And we will see you next time here. Faith and Victory Church online. Good night.